Hello everyone, and welcome to episode 61. If you've been listening to the podcast since the very beginning, then you should be starting to feel as if you've dipped your feet and are now standing about ankle deep in the ocean of biology. Our first steps into this realm made us familiar with biomolecules, and cells, and chromosomes, and a few more steps made us familiar with the processes of evolution, the cycles of ecology, and the biomes that cover the surface of the Earth. Then I began looking at plants in great detail, at their physiology and their evolutionary diversity. But alas, we've come to the end of those two series. Now, it's time to focus on a new branch on the Tree of Life. Now, it's time to learn about fungi. If you listen to episode 34 on fungus as part of my series on the diversity of life, that episode will be a kind of rough summary of this entire series, where in episode 34, I talked briefly about all aspects of fungi. You know, I touched on their physiology, their feeding strategies, and their symbiotic and parasitic relationships with other life forms. This series on the fungal physiology We'll explore all of those topics and more in much, much greater detail. So if you recently listened to episode 34, or if you just paused this episode to go listen to it and you just got back, some of what you hear in this series might sound pretty familiar. Not necessarily repeated word for word, of course, but some of the concepts and some of the facts that I mentioned in episode 34 will certainly be re-examined and re-explored. Now, with all of this tedious housekeeping out of the way, it's time to dive into the world of fungi, beginning with an exploration of their development and their physiology. Perhaps the most fundamental aspect of fungal physiology, the one thing, if you remember anything, the one thing that you should remember about fungi is that they have a very high surface area to volume ratio. This quality defines their ecological role. It defines their life strategies, it defines their morphology, and it defines the patterns of growth that fungi express as they age and spread throughout the soil. This high surface area to volume ratio is achieved through structures called hyphae. The fungus body is essentially a wet mass of hyphae, all dividing and growing and spreading to find food to dissolve into metabolically accessible nutrients that it can then use as fuel and material to sustain more growth and even more spreading throughout the soil. Each individual hyphae is a cylindrical structure. It's extremely thin and extremely long. You can think of them like strings or threads or filaments that are just 2 to 10 micrometers in diameter. This is the same size or the same scale as your typical bacteria. And bacteria are extremely small, especially when compared to eukaryotic cells. The individual cells in a fungus's hyphae, they are eukaryotic cells, but they're extremely thin and very long. Much like the plants with their apical meristems, cellular division in the hyphae takes place at the very tip, which allows the hyphae to creep like a snake through its substrate as it searches for food. Sometimes, these hyphal tips will split, or fork, creating two parallel hyphae. Sometimes, the hyphae will grow branches that shoot off at sharp angles in some other direction. Sometimes, one hyphae may come into contact with another hyphae, and they'll merge together in a process called anastomosis, or hyphal fusion. Essentially, these growth forms create a tangled mass of hyphae tissue, a cellular spaghetti, if you will, that forms the body of the fungus. These complex masses of hyphae form networks, extremely sophisticated chemical networks, that are called mycelium, or mycelia. Each mycelial network is considered one individual fungus. Growing out of the hyphae, either protrusions coming out at steep angles, or as altered tips of the hyphae themselves, you have all manner of specialized structures that the fungus uses for getting food, for reproduction, 
and for fusing and growing together with other hyphae. Some of these structures include the arbuscules of mycorrhizal fungi, which dig into the cells of a plant's root to establish a point of symbiotic nutrient exchange, or the conidiophores and the phyllides that work as platforms for asexual reproduction by releasing spores that can create new mycelia. However, I'll talk about all of these structures in much greater detail when I get to their respective episodes on fungal nutrition and fungal reproduction. I want to explore fungal anastomosis in a little more detail because I think it's really interesting and it creates extremely cool-looking fungal structures, like interweaving interconnected veins and webs. The numerous anastomoses between the countless hyphae also create a hugely interconnected network where nutrients and hormones and other biochemicals can easily flow from one end of the fungus to the other end across its entire body structure. In this way, the entire fungus can be made aware of the presence of food, or differing levels of pH and salinity, or the presence of dangerous chemicals and other environmental contaminants, even though only a few hyphae out of the, the fungus's millions of hyphae may currently be in direct contact with whatever variable it happens to be. So, how do these anastomoses form on a chemical level? It's actually not particularly well understood. Fungi use a variety of different mechanisms to establish these anastomoses, one such method being with pheromones to detect and communicate with nearby hyphae. The growing tips of the hyphae will produce specialized tubular structures called conidial anastomosis tubes, or CATs for short, that grow to become bridges between proximate hyphae. These develop out of structures called conidia, which can take two forms. One form of conidia is for asexual reproduction, as it produces spores that form new mycelia. The other form of the conidia is morphologically and physiologically distinct, as it's intended to support vegetative growth, not reproduction. This is the conidia anastomosis tube, or the cat, which is generally smaller and unbranching relative to the, uh, the reproductive conidia. When these cats are formed in adjacent hyphae, they'll release some kind of pheromone or some kind of signaling mechanism as the tubes can be observed to engage in a kind of homing behavior. They can literally sense where the other tube is, and they'll grow towards it, eventually fusing to form a cohesive, singular tube connecting the individual hyphae. Again, this process isn't particularly well understood, but studies have found that the genes and the signal conduction pathways that are used in this conidia anastomosis tube fusion are, more or less, the same genes and the same signal conduction pathways used in the mating process of cellular fusion in single-celled fungi like yeast. Okay, now back to the hyphae themselves. There's two types of hyphal tissue, septate and cenocytic. Septate, from the word septum, or the Latin septa, is an enclosing wall or barrier. And as the septate hyphae are multicellular, and typically only one cell wide, they're basically a single file thread of cells connected end to end. Each cell end, connecting it to the adjacent cells, is defined by a structure called a septa, which is like an internal cell wall, or a plate, or a thick sieve, that runs perpendicular to the length of the hyphae. This wall, or plate, is part of a greater cell wall in the fungal cells, much like the cell wall in plants. Now, both the plant and fungal cell walls contain chemicals called glucans, which are long polysaccharides that help to give the cell wall its strength. However, fungal cells also have a material called chitin, which is a long-chain polymer composed of N-acetylglucosamine monomers. This is really interesting, because it's like a, a glimpse into the evolutionary history of fungi. It's interesting, because plants don't have chitin, but arthropods do. Insect and crustacean exoskeletons are packed with chitin, 
and you also have chitin in the scales of fish, on the scales on butterfly wings, and even in the beaks of squid and octopus. So yeah, that's just a, a neat little evolutionary detail that shows off the fact that fungi are more closely related to animals than they are to plants. And that might be kind of surprising, kind of counterintuitive. I think it's one of those really awesome little details of Earth's natural evolutionary history. Anyway, these septa structures that divide each fungal cell in a hyphae are porous, so as to allow for the relatively unobstructed flow of cellular stuff throughout the length of the hyphae. This cellular stuff includes cytoplasm and absorbed nutrients, as well as organelles that need to be moved around, and even nuclei. And this ability to move nuclei around their body through the cells means that fungi can apply very concentrated uh, enzymatic responses to various stimuli, like maybe part of their body gets exposed to a contaminant. They can flood that area with nuclei, which carry you know, all of the genes, which can then be read and expressed to produce various enzymes that can engage in uh, protecting the biological tissue, isolating the contaminant, and uh, either metabolizing it or removing it from the tissue, or like the scorched earth policy in a biological context of just killing off the whole infected area, the whole damaged area, and moving away. It's a very dynamic kind of cellular enzymatic response that other organisms like plants or uh, animals really can't do. The other kind of hyphae are the cenocytic variety. These cenocytic fungi are really crazy, because they don't have septas dividing their cells. Cenocytic hyphae are essentially long cellular tubes packed with all of the nuclei and organelles of what would be their individual cells, except because there's no hard divisions, no septas, the cenocytic hyphae are massively long, multinucleated supercells. Cytoplasm, nutrients, organelles, and nuclei are able to flow completely unrestricted and unobstructed throughout the entire length of the hyphae. A cenocytic fungus growing in the soil right under your feet is like a living layer in the substrate, a single, massive, hugely tentacled but tangled supercell spreading out its fibrous, uh, spreading out its fibrous tentacles in what's called a mycelial wave front, expanding outwards in this layer of soil in the search for food, for nutrients. The accumulated growth of all of these mycelial wave fronts, of all of the different fungi out there in the wilderness, all of their created fungal bodies, accounts for something on the order of 30% of the organic content in the soil. That's immense. That's huge. Either living or dead, Fungal tissues compose a huge portion of the soil, about a third of it. And according to the famous mycologist Paul Stamets, for every meter of tree root that penetrates and grows through the soil, there's a kilometer of fungal mycelia. These facts should give some insight into just how extensive and ever-present fungus is, how thorough and endless its growth is, and how pervasive fungi are throughout the world's ecosystems. If you want to hear more from the world-famous mycologist Paul Stamets, a great place to start would be his appearance on Joe Rogan's podcast, episode 1035. That's a great way to spend two hours, because that interview is as mind-blowing as it is information-dense. So if you're interested in fungus, you really should go and check that out. Alright, so earlier, I briefly mentioned single-celled fungi, as contrasted to the multicellular filamentous hyphae fungi. These are the two basic growth forms of fungi, single-cellular and filamentous, with all of this tangled hyphae. They're also called, respectively, yeasts and molds. Because the yeasts are single-celled, they don't have this complex, relatively large physical structure, and and the network that molds and other filamentous fungi have. The yeasts typically grow in patterns that are not dissimilar from bacteria. They're, they're very similar to bacteria. They form thin mats covering whatever substrate it is that they're growing on, and their appearance as they grow on whatever substrate is essentially of a powder, 
and they can grow in a huge variety of places, under a huge variety of conditions. They can grow on uh, fruits, you know, on rotting vegetation like fallen trees, and various species of yeast can even grow on the skin of animals, like the Trichosporin cutaneum and the Candida albicans, which grow on human skin. There are yeasts that grow in water and marine environments, yeasts that grow in the gut of all kinds of animals, from mammals to insects, as, as part of the community of gut flora that helps to participate in the animal's digestion of food. Much like bacteria, the yeasts are these single-celled organisms that produce a huge variety of chemicals, everything from medicines to foods to poisons, which have an equally huge range of applications in human society. However, I'll talk more about the numerous uses of yeasts and other fungi in a later episode exploring the relationship between humans and fungi. The molds are the filamentous fungi that I've been talking about for most of the episode so far. The molds grow on dead or dying organic matter, using heterotrophic metabolic processes to break down the organic matter and absorb the nutrients to fuel their own growth. When mold grows on, for example, a piece of fruit, the fruit will visibly decay as the fungus consumes it for nutrients and breaks down its tissue. The consumed part of the fruit will be soft and squishy and half-melted, you know, it'll be liquidy. And the mold itself will grow to cover more of the surface until it eventually becomes visible to the naked eye and eventually covers the whole fruit. And you, you can't eat the fruit anymore, it's ruined. Even though the individual hyphae fibers are microscopic and thus not visible to the naked eye, when molds grow to cover the outer surface of a fruit or some other kind of organic matter, this accumulated hyphal mass, this mycelium, becomes very visible. Macroscopic mold growths can have a wide variety of morphologies, based on the species and the growth patterns of the fungus in question. Some molds look like small, dense clumps of white or brown or green that creep across the surface of the substrate. Other molds look really fuzzy, with the tangled hyphae forming larger ropes or braids that are visible to the naked eye as very thin strands or filaments. The various colors that define the species of mold come from the macroscopic effect of pigments, or darkly colored spores. Now, each cell in the mycelium might express a little bit of pigment, like some melanin to protect the, the chromosomes from UV radiation. And when this tissue, with all of these cells expressing that little bit of melanin, is viewed at a macroscopic level, all of these bits of pigment blur together to create the green, blue, white, brown, tan, or black hues that are so characteristic of the molds. It's also important to understand that when you look at a rotting vegetable, for example, and you see that it's got mold growing on it. That mold is one cohesive mycelial network. It's one individual, even though it may appear to be composed of thousands of smaller strands or clumps. As the mycelial wavefront cascades across the substrate, the cytoplasm and the organelles and the nuclei needed to support the fungal growth and metabolism will generally flow towards this wavefront, towards the tips of the hyphae. This is where all of the metabolic action is. This is where those, uh, the nuclei and all of the organelles are needed to process all of the incoming nutrients and to help support this growth. But a consequence of this is that it leaves behind these dried out husks of older hyphal tissue that have already absorbed all of the nutrients around it. All those nutrients, they, they've been absorbed and metabolized. Just as the root of a vascular plant absorbs water and nutrients mostly near the tip of the root, and this propels the root to perpetually dig and search through the soil for more nutrients, the mycelia also absorbs water and nutrients mostly near the tips of its hyphae. And so the bulk of the cellular structures and cellular activity in the fungus takes place within the wave front, within that growing edge of the hyphae network. What gets left behind are the skeletal structures of older hyphal cells that no longer really engage in metabolic activity, because all of the proximate nutrients have been absorbed, 
and all of the cytoplasm and other stuff has flowed outwards to where there's actually nutrients to be metabolized. In this way, the mold searches for food, and grows in greater concentrations where it finds food. Where the fungus doesn't find food, or where it's already consumed all the food and there's nothing left, it'll tend to thin out, or it just won't grow very dense in the first place, and it will just move on through on its journey to find more food. This growth pattern creates mycelia that are actually remarkably effective and efficient at spreading themselves out between food sources. A famous example of this was an experiment conducted in late 2009 and published in early 2010 with the yellow slime mold Physarum polycephalum. Now, right off the bat, I should say that slime molds are technically not true fungi. They are fungus-like organisms classified as protists, but their growth patterns are really similar to the true fungi, and this particular study is a good example of fungal growth patterns. So, this yellow slime mold in question, Physarum polycephalum, is much like a cenocytic fungus in that it's essentially a giant multinucleated supercell. In the wild, these slime molds explore their habitat by sending out an expanding, circular wave of tissue in the form of a mesh of extremely fine hyphae analogs, which then, through the course of their exploration, will come into contact with sources of food. The slime mold will build up tissue where the food is, where it detects food and it will create vascular structures, or tubes, connecting the food sources to the rest of the slime mold, so as to shuttle nutrients back and forth across an efficient pathway. If you were to see this yellow slime mold in the wild, it might look like some kind of yellow alien vascular system creeping across a dead, fallen tree or something. The mature, refined growth form looks like a thick mass of yellow veins. It's super cool, but also super creepy. Anyway, researchers at the Hokkaido University in Sapporo, Japan, created a map of the Tokyo Super Metropolis, and they put 35 little nodes of food, in this case a bunch of oat flakes, where smaller towns and suburbs are located in relation to the Tokyo city proper. They even had a little replicated coastline on their map that acted as a border to the slime mold's growth. The P. polycephalum slime mold was placed at the center of the node that represented the heart of Tokyo, and it was allowed to grow across this little mini-map to explore and find the oat flakes. Over the course of several hours, this slime mold analog to a mycelial wave front was expanding outwards from its origin, covering the map in a relatively dense mat of tissue. Where it found oat flakes, the mold tissue would concentrate its growth, and encapsulate the oat flakes and begin consuming them. While the nearest oat flakes got covered and were slowly consumed, the wave front continued to expand, its density decreasing as it spread out across a larger and larger area. As the wave front expanded and explored outwards, it would run into more and more oat flakes, and it would encapsulate them to make more food-absorbing nodes. After five hours of growth, it had covered the seven nearest oat flakes. After eight hours, it had reached 13 nodes. After 11 hours, 23 nodes. After 16 hours, 32 nodes. By 26 hours into the experiment, the slime mold had reached every node and had fully explored the minimap. It was in these later hours of growth where the really interesting stuff started to happen. As the wave front expanded farther and farther out into the countryside, so to speak, the tissue in the areas that it had already explored began to recede. The slime mold retracted from areas where there wasn't any food, which corresponded to areas on the map with no towns or major suburbs, and its tissue then concentrated on the oat flakes. However, this receding, this retraction of tissue, did not cut off the nodes from one another. Instead, the slime mold retained a single tube structure connecting one node to another, like a subway train. When the slime mold had expanded to fill the entire map, 
and it had nowhere else to explore, the receding tissue created a refined network of tubes connecting all of the little oat flakes, and thus all of the little nodes of metabolically active slime mold tissue. The inefficient tubes that were too long or too out of the way also receded, leaving behind only the strongest, most efficiently positioned tubes. What the slime mold had effectively created in a single day was a nearly perfect recreation of the Tokyo subway system that had taken hundreds of professional engineers months, if not years, to design. The slime mold's network, its recreation of the subway system, was just as efficient, just as effective, and in some cases, even more so. Without a brain or eyes, the slime mold was able to create a transport network to shuttle nutrients that equaled, and in some places even surpassed, the skill of some of the world's best engineers. If that's not one of the coolest things ever, I don't know what is. I don't know what's cool anymore. Now, again, I know that this slime mold isn't technically a true fungus, but the general growth patterns that I've described here are the same. Fungal molds will extend their hyphae in the mycelial wave front in the search for food, and when they find it, they will build up their tissue to maximize the breakdown and absorption of nutrients. Where there are no nutrients, or where all of the available nutrients have been consumed, the hyphal networks will recede. In this way, the slime mold, and pretty much all fungal molds, grow like a kind of dynamic mesh network, reinforcing growth where the nutrients can support it, and dying off and receding where they can't. As long as the fungus can continue to find food, it can continue to shuttle nutrients throughout its entire body and stay alive. And it can continue growing to cover a massive area. The largest fungus ever discovered is an individual of the honey fungus species Armillaria ostoii, which exists in the Malheur National Forest in eastern Oregon, in the northwestern corner of the contiguous United States. This specimen is believed to be something like 2,400 years old, and it covers a whopping 8.9 square kilometers, or 2,200 acres, which is a greater area than 660 football fields. Despite its sweet-sounding name, this honey fungus is parasitic of plants with woody tissue, like trees. As the massive, ancient honey fungus of Oregon is situated in the Malheur National Forest, it has no shortage of trees and other woody plants to kill and saprophytically consume. It does this with what's called white rot, or root rot, where it infects roots and strangles the host by depriving it of the nutrients it gets from the soil, which obviously will slowly kill the host. This is totally fine for the fungus, as it can not only feed off of the parasitized nutrients, it can also feed off of the dying and dead plant tissue, and it grows its fruiting bodies, its mushrooms, out of the side of this dying tree. This fruiting body, or the sporocarp, is perhaps the most visible aspect of their physiology, due to their macroscopic size and typically bright, sometimes vivid, coloration. These fruiting bodies are relatively dense collections of tightly interwoven, tangled hyphae, which create the macroscopic structure used for releasing a huge amount of spores. The most common fruiting body that you might be familiar with is the mushroom. The mushroom is an epigeous fruiting body, or one that grows above the ground, epigeus, geo, for earth. In contrast, there are hypogeous fruiting bodies, which grow below the surface. These are called truffles. These truffles typically grow in a symbiotic relationship with the roots of trees, where they attract animals who eat them, and by picking them up out of the ground and destroying them through chewing and consumption, the animal inevitably ends up spreading their spores. This method of dispersal is relatively barbaric, as it's literally the fungus just giving up part of its body to brute mechanical forces, like shaking and crushing, which will then destroy the tissue 
but release the spores and scatter them all over the place. The epigeous fruiting bodies, on the other hand, have somewhat more sophisticated methods of spore dispersal. They can use water, as in the case of marine-based or hydrophilic fungi. They can use air, where the spores are simply released into the wind. And they can also take advantage of simple mechanical dispersal through animal interference. The structures of these epigeous sporocarps vary wildly from species to species, which makes the observation and the study of the sporocarp an effective way to identify what species you're looking at. For example, there's a major lineage of fungi called the Ascomycetes, or the sac fungi, which produces sporocarps called ascocarps. These typically take the form of some kind of sac, which are the spore-producing structures that line the inside of the sac. Some subtypes of these include apotheceum structures, which are like saucers or bowls held up on a stalk coming out of the ground. There's the parathecium types, which are small little flask-shaped structures with a little pore at the top, through which the spores are released. One of the cooler structures are the cleistothecium, which are globular structures with an outer layer dotted by irregular pits and folds. They look weirdly alien and creepy, and as I sit here looking at pictures of them, I'm finding them quite difficult to describe. There's another major clade of fungi called the Basidiomycetes, which grow fruiting bodies in the more traditional mushroom shape, which is called an agaric growth form. These agaric fruiting bodies have a cap resting on a stalk, with the underside of the cap defined by gills, or pores, or tubes, or some other spore-releasing structure. Other types of Basidiomycetes fruiting bodies include polypores, which grow off the sides of trees in the form of a half-cap, or a fan shape. These are also called conchs, bracket fungi, or shelf fungi, as they make what appears to be little organic shelves that small animals like insects can walk upon. There are the Sicotioid fungi that have epigeous sporocarps that look like small balloons or lobes. There's the Gastroid fungi that have a similarly shaped fruiting body, but these lobes or spheres are raised up on little stalks, whereas the Sicotioid fruiting bodies are just blobs sitting right on the ground. Some of these raised Gastroid fungi include puffballs, which are fungi that produce spores inside of an internal structure that can be popped to release the spores in a little mini-explosion, aided in part by the forceful release of internal gases. This is what gives them their puffing quality and their puffball name. As a child, playing around outside, I can recall finding and stepping on a lot of puffball mushrooms that would release a stinky green puff of gas along with their spores. Little six-year-old me thought that that was a plant fart, and I thought it was hilarious. Anyways, there are numerous kinds of fruiting bodies that I haven't described, as describing them all would take a really long time. As these structures are involved in the sexual reproduction of fungi, I'll talk more about them in much greater detail in the upcoming episode on fungal reproduction. But as for fungal development and physiology, I think I've covered a decent amount of material here, so I'll wrap it up. This was a fun and interesting episode for me to write and record, but it was also challenging, as fungi are deceptively complex and incredibly diverse. The world of fungi is enigmatic and awe-inspiring, as fungi play a critical role in maintaining and perpetuating our world's ecosystems. They are the consumers of detritus, recycling nutrients back into the ecosystem. They are the symbiotes of the vascular plants, sustaining them with critical nutrients that the plants struggle to get on their own. They are the unseen gardeners of the shady underworld of life, keeping the biosphere going from their hidden position within the dark, damp soil. Join me next week as I explore the hydration and nutrition of fungi, and how they break down detritus to recycle these nutrients back into the ecosystem to help keep life going. And as always, thanks for listening. <laughs>